everybody? Everybody good? Hello. Good in? <laughs> if I have to be here in a way, you too. Okay. <laughs> I like to start off and give us a, uh, a mood setting, an energy setting with a welcome. Um, quite often when I come and speak to people, uh, my mother is with me and she is a better singer than I am. <laughs> but we love to bring harmony in the room, a balance into the room. Um, quite often we also talk about how each of you were never given an opportunity or a chance, and we weren't, to actually welcome you to this land. Okay? So today is our official welcome. Hey, you. Jim Crow, the Civil Rights Movement, and the American Indian Movement. And we know that the community, you and your families, your neighbors, your friends, have stories to tell about these experiences, stories that we need to hear and understand and learn from. We're committed at the foundation to lifting up voices that often haven't been heard uh, without, as our board chair, Virginia Busby, often says, speaking for you or over you. Uh, we also recognize that these conversations are difficult. I'm, I'm nervous being here and, and opening this conversation, but I think it's really important. Um, it's complex and it's challenging, but we, we want to be engaging in these discussions. Um, and we've included recommendations in the front of your program. There are recommendations about how to participate in today's discussion. Um, 
we use this guidance with our students who come here, and that is designed really to encourage dialogue that's respectful and accountable, as well as compassionate and honest. And the goal is to carry us to different places of understanding about one another in the world. I'll also mention at this point that there are index cards on your seats, and those white index cards are for you to write questions. If you have questions for the panel that you'd like to offer, you can write them on the index card, and um, Shamika and I will stand at the back and collect them up. We'll also have the opportunity for you all to speak into the microphone and ask your questions directly if you're comfortable doing that. The other thing I wanted to mention is that we have um, a couple of other pieces. One is a survey for Maryland Humanities that are funding this project. And then this one, the yellow sheet, has a set of questions that is designed to help with public scoping, and our interpretive planning consultant will help uh, explain what that's all about later. So the important thing now is to know that you can write down your questions and pass them in, or you can ask questions of the panel. We want this to be a dialogue um, so that we can get to a different understanding. And it's really this enhanced understanding and the opportunity to build trust and connect deeply and meaningfully with other people that we want to encourage through our interpretive planning process here at the foundation. Um, it's what we think is going to get us to a different place where we're offering a more authentic story of this landscape and one that welcomes all visitors and helps us to connect to one another. So thank you for being here. Thanks for everyone um, who's investing and sharing and listening and learning from one another. I look forward to the conversation and I'll introduce Virginia Busby, who's the Aki Peak Foundation's board chair. Virginia is an archeologist who has expertise in historic preservation, land conservation, and cultural resource management. And we're very fortunate to have your leadership on the board at this time. Thank you, Laura. Thank you everybody for joining with us. Um, I'm really honored to be sitting with our panel and the moderator and with all of you. Um, thank you to our amazing staff who works so diligently to make our, to our programs are responsive and to make sure that we have a welcoming space where we can enter into this conversation. Thank you guys. Um, so thank all of you for joining with us at this second in our series of Land and River uh, conversations. I'd especially like to thank the Piscataway people who are with us. Today. Thank you for those who have always been here with us also. Um, so thank you, our panelists, Crystal Proctor, and thank you, Dr. Gabrielle Tanak and Chris Newman, and thank you, our moderator, Dr. Julie King. And I'm very grateful for our food that's been made available by Copper Kettle. I'm, I'm here just only for the food. <laughs> it's, it's a really uh, honor to have that available. Thank you. Um, as Laura and Shemika indicated, the Foundation is dedicated to joining with you, to engaging in transformational dialogue, to move how we interpret and how we work with people and the land. And our board is fully committed to the dialogue, seeking to use our position, our situatedness, to be catalysts and collaborators for honoring people and the land. And we're committed to listening and to being uncomfortable in the exploration. We're, we're also committed to doing the hard work of transformation and seeking to live reciprocally. We've chosen to make this evident in our value statement that I think is in our, our program. And our board manifests our commitment by also being present with you today. And I'd like to recognize some of our trustees who were here at the first one and who are also joining us here today. Mr. Jim Potts, thank you for being here. And Gene Roberts and his wife, Lynn, thank you for making the time to be with us. And to our, our past CEOs, Lisa Hayes and Will Corcoran, and your wonderful wife, Mary Bruce, thank you for joining with us and your long-term commitment to making this um, successful. And one last thing before I be quiet and listen is that I'll ask you to look around the room today and see if there are people who aren't here who you think should be here, and please, let us know who we should also seek out to include. And please reach out and invite those people to our next one or to come and enter into dialogue with, dialogue with us in a way that's comfortable for them so that we can understand what their needs and thoughts are. And uh, with that, I'm, I'm going to hand the mic back to Shanika to continue on. Thank you very much. 
This second workshop of the Landing River series is titled Reciprocity, Humans and the Environment because of the relationships that have shaped our region and continue to influence our interactions with one another and with the environment. Our moderator for today is Dr. Julie King, who has 30 years experience studying, writing, and teaching about historical archaeology and Chesapeake history and culture. Her book, Archaeology Narrative and the Politics of the Past, The View from Southern Maryland, received a book award from the American Association of State and Local History in 2013. She has graciously agreed to be our moderator for this series. Our panelists today are Sylvanaqua Farms co-founder Chris Newman, a member of the Choptico Band of Piscataway Indians. Chris places a heavy emphasis on the indigenous ethics, values, and knowledge serving as the often unacknowledged foundation of the modern permaculture movement and the decolonized worldview necessary to ensure the sustainable stewardship of natural resources. Chris Proctor, who was born a fifth generation clan mother and two spirit of the Cedarville Band, wild turkey clan of the Piscataway Kanoi Nation, art is her way of release and expression. Healing also comes from music production, spending <coughs> hours with Mother Earth, and artistic creation. Chris's work has been featured in many exhibits in the D.C. area. Dr. Gabrielle Taya, a member of the Piscataway Indian Nation, is an activist scholar committed to empowering indigenous perspectives. She is proud to serve in the elevation of Native women and girls as the director of Legacy Collections at the Spirit Aligned Leadership Program. Gabi earned her Ph.D. and M.A. in Sociology from Harvard University. And Robert Berloni, who collaborates with cultural institutions to develop innovative programs, trains interpreters, and facilitates strategic planning. He is the Akiki Foundation's interpretive planning consultant. I now turn it over to Julie for the panel discussion. All right, I'm going to see if this works. It might make some loud screeching sound. It does. Is it working? We're not, we're not going to use the mic. Pardon? Oh, mics. Oh, we just, okay. But, uh, that's absolutely wonderful. <laughs> I won't worry about that. I can barely do powerful. Um, so I'd like to echo um, the staff's welcome uh, of the audience today to participate in this really important conversation and to thank Laura and Shamika and Angela for the opportunity um, to participate in our distinguished panel for um, uh, coming here on this gorgeous, beautiful um, April afternoon. Uh, as the moderator, I'm going to really just ask some questions and then uh, start with our panel and then we're going to turn it over to our audience to also ask questions of our panel. The theme is reciprocity. You see that on your, um, your uh, program, reciprocity, humans and the environment. So my questions, which I developed or we developed in collaboration last week, um, are going to follow on that theme. So I think I'll start with uh, asking our panelists. What is your personal relationship to this landscape and to the land in general? Or maybe our people with Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, that's a good question. Mm. We don't have enough time together, do we? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I, I know this. I say this to a lot of people, and it comes off very strange um, because of my personal connection to the land. I think that um, when you say to someone <clears throat> that your ancestors have been here for over 16,000 years, how can, you, how can you accept that? How can you receive that? How can you understand it? And that's a question I ask myself quite often. Like how do I how do I in, in take that and then project it to other people when I say that? Um, and then of course we will bring up maybe it's it's even been longer than that. And for our for our own ancestors, we say we've been here forever. If, before there was anything such thing as time to us. So when we say those things and when I talk to people about that, it's about every single bone in my body is connected to every leaf outside and how I must give all of my energy and oneness to everything that surrounds me 
And I work for not only Piscataway people, but each and every single one of you, because then you become a part of the land, which thus is a part of me. So we, we no longer become separate, or a races of people, or genders, etc. So I guess my short answer would be oneness, completeness, balance. Is it appropriate to Always appropriate. So just a little bit down the line. Well, first I would like to give my, my honor and respect and love um, to our people that are here and to all of you and to the landscape and to the ancestors that are with us and all around us and the ancestors that have arrived in all different kinds of ways. Um, I would like to thank you Chris for opening up with your voice and bringing that song and that you know for you to say that um, you're not as good of a singer as your mother is absolutely <laughs> <laughs> And so when we, we talk about what the relationship is. It is about a relationship. It is a going back and forth. We can, you know, give you as a historian, I can give you all kinds of interesting facts, some of which you know, some of which you may not know. Um, as you said, you can put a time limit on it. You can go back to 16,000 years of the Piscataway people and ancestors and other people who've come across this landscape for a very, very long time. And the fact that we carry that lineage with us and the way that we move through this time and space is very layered. Like when I go out into the, out onto the road or into places that have been built up uh, to look more urban. I, I was born and raised in New York City and I came back here as um, an adult to family that was here seeking that connection to this place because it was through my father and I wanted to know always what was, what was underneath, what's underneath and how do you see a landscape, some of which has changed, um, almost all of it has changed, right? Because the trees that we see are, are different, the river that we look at it's different, the animals, um, all of our faces are, are different, but that connection means that somebody, um, I think a woman maybe got up every morning and sang and greeted the day and faced the sun and made that decision and did that over time. And maybe it was when the rivers were uh, deep and clear and there was 95% old growth forest. Maybe it was when those trees were cleared and people were also brought here against their will in slavery, others looking for freedom in a different space, our relatives that had been uh, taken from us. But even then, a woman got up every single day and made a decision and sang to that sun somewhere along the way. So it's not a mystical connection. You know, we can talk about it. Um, yes, there is a spiritual aspect to it and spirit pervades everything, but it's also a decision and a conscientious choice uh, for us to have a personal relationship. So through my father who left here in the 1940s, his name was Joseph, um, he left quite honestly because he felt that the racism was so crushing that he couldn't be himself. And he went out to sea and ended up in New York. And his lineage came down through his father, Turkey Tayak, who's buried uh, just down the road here with the ancestors. And that was also a conscientious choice uh, for um, my, my relatives' families that I'm sitting with here. They made that choice. Um, to stay, and it's, it's not easy a choice to come back. So the relationship is deep, and it's changed in many ways over time. We all might 
look different, sound different. But when it comes down to it, I think that the, the personal relationship, it's, it's not just as an individual, but it is about a collective choice, a decision that's made because in spite of all the things that have happened, or maybe because of all of the things that have happened, we can see that this land is so astonishingly and awe-inspiringly beautiful. And so it's worth it to be here. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna to try to follow that. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so you asked about connection to place, and with me being a farmer, that's always a really interesting question. Um, sooner or later, and probably sooner, my daughters are going to be able to ask me, where do you go when you die? Everybody always asks that question. It's a great unknown with your kids. It scares the hell out of them. In our, in our world here, in a lot of Eastern Woodland world here, there's the idea that when you die, your blood and your bones go into the ground. They literally go into the ground and then they become the soil. When I put a spade in the ground, when I put a planting stick in the ground, or if I plant a tree, or if I see a pig till up a little bit of ground that I want to renovate, or when I see grass grow out of it, when I see trees grow out of it, when I see maize grow out of it, what that means for me, metaphysically, is that my ancestors are still feeding me. People who lived and died 16,000 years ago or beyond are still here. You put your hands on a piece of dirt and you're embracing your grandfather and your grandmother that you've never met. And that's real. Because when you're gone, when you go on the earth and you disperse into that ground, we are one. There's no sex, there's no race. There's just that soil and there's just life. So that's my connection to, to the land that comes from a distinctly native worldview, especially in this, in this part of the country. Um, when it comes to this place specifically, uh, Akaki, it gets, you know, my people specifically aren't from here. We're from further south, we're out of the Chocolate Reserve, further south of Maryland. Um, but there was a unique and unusual time in history where we were somewhat united. Um, for us, unity wasn't an anomaly. You know, we had our own traditions, we had our own clans, we were you know, related in some ways, unrelated in others. Um, we were far more sophisticated than we're all being credited for. Um, but when I look at this place and what's around here, and those bones rest here, and continue to feed us, and provide our spirits with, with what's here, I look at... I see a time that was, you know, a, a really specific time where we were together. You know, that was the result of you know, very unique political circumstances and social circumstances. If you look at you know, the corollary, what's that like for Americans, for white Americans? If you look at what the American character is today, when you think of things like patriotism, and you think of national unity, and you look at some of our social programs, you know, social security, some of, the, some of the things that define who we are, are all the result of a very, very rare progressive time in American history during post-war where you had disasters from the Great Depression to World War II forcing us to act collectively. And with Native people, we had similarly sophisticated circumstances bearing down on us that forced us to either come together or drift apart. As, as uh, Dr. Tayek said, you know, the racism that her family experienced here made them go away. And a lot of people had that impulse because it was crushing. My great-grandfather, was around here at the time that Custer was killed. You could kill Indians in the street at that time and just not worry about it. It was, it was just like lynchings. The sheriff had his picture taken. Didn't make a difference. Um, so when I see a place like this, my connection, even though I don't have a physical connection here, even though I'm sure some of my ancestors are here, it reminds me of the complexity of that history and what it has to teach us today. Because there's parallels with the most sophisticated societies on earth and with some of the most existential problems that we've had as a people, and that as we, as a broader and what now this country is, are facing today. When Native people talk about connections to the land, you'll often hear, we're still here. 
And that's a reminder that's necessary, but I, I feel like it almost, it's bearing the lead. Mm -hmm. I look at white people and say, you're still here. How is that possible? <laughs> it, it's like this society that's been imposed on this place is trying to eradicate itself sometimes with what we've done to the land, the air, the water, with what rapacious capitalism, unrestricted capitalism <laughs> has done to people in this society. And it has caused us to live a fundamentally extractive existence in this place. What I see in Akiki and some of the programs and projects that are going on here from this discussion, where we're having an honest, decolonized discussion about what this place means, to things like the National Food Forest, where we're trying to decide how can we finally stop segregating things like food production and conservation and culture and realize that they need to be together or else. That's what my connection is, is to this place. I see it as being a demonstration of what the future can be and frankly has to be, given the problems that we're facing as human beings, and not just as native people. Uh, thank you. Uh, I also want to reinforce what Laura said about the cards, the index cards, so if you have questions, you need to be filling them out. I, I think that a theme that I picked up as I was listening was you talked about the antiquity of your history in this land, and I think all of you touched on it in both not so happy ways, but also in other ways that give you strength. So I wanted to um, ask you, there are a couple of questions that came out. For example, how do we get tied to landscape? You know, how do we get tied to place? Because you were noting that you're not tied to this place, you're tied to this place. But before we maybe go to that question, I wanted to ask you if you would, um, if you would each think about the historical relationships with the land. Are there, are there any historical relationships that you think rise to the top that need to be discussed? And especially in a period in American society where we hear all the time that people aren't interested in history anymore. Um, do you, how do you see history, what role does history play, and how does that, how does, how does your history help with that, addressing that issue? Is that really not clear or, or muddled <laughs> enough? It's an it's a intense question, I can start with it. Um, just think about the situation that we're in, right here. We have an extensive, set of ossuary burial grounds within the land that those ancestors that are with us and 16,000 years is a, you know, when you're talking about how do you comprehend that? Think about what's happened to you in the past year. <laughs> your relationships, things that have happened in your life. And then go 16,000, we tend to kind of jump, right? Um, so a lot happened. We don't know everything that happened. Um, but we're looking at this location. Let's say, let's just go to this specific location. Right across the river, we're facing Mount Vernon. Which also, by looking back at us, has had a peculiar way of both having divested much of our presence, but also has preserved a location where we can still come back to because of the protective um, legislation that created the park. How ironic and weird is that? It's, it's a strange thing, <laughs> really. It's, it's a very deep, just, you know, when you look at like the parable, you know, it's like, how is that? How are we looking at each other? Um, so just looking at the space and the idea that the major, uh, major town was here at Echo Peak and then further up and then, you know, looking at, and I don't think, our people used to move around a lot and intermarry, they were, you know, you look at historic, um, accounts and look at look at people that are kind of maybe living more like like we did more recently like in the Amazon they all speak like four or five languages they they interconnect a lot so I like to look at that to get an idea about this idea of flow that we're not so separated 
So in terms of um, you know, the historic presence, I think something that rises to the top is to, I liked what you also said about asking, you know, how is it that, that other people are still here to the degree that they are um, versus, you know, us. But how is it that just in the presence, asking those questions about why even in the heart of the homeland, even with the names in the ground, like Akokik and Piscataway and Potomac, is the understanding of uh, the indigenous history and our interconnected history, it's still so foreign. It seems so strange, you know? And so I think that that, in a sense, to me, like, just that, that odd interaction, and then you go back and put in details and questions and ideas, um, facts and things that have happened in history, but just bringing that, that question. Um, I had an interesting experience with my dad while he was still alive. He came, uh, we were down at Captain Billy's Crab House, um, and you know, here's a brown-skinned, native, very native-looking man who had grown his hair long in his older age you know, to become a man of peace. And we walked in, and they asked me, they're like, oh, do you know how to eat crab, sir? You know, are you from somewhere? You know, where are you from? Are you from, where, where, where are you from? And then someone starts trying to speak Spanish, which actually he could speak to. Um, but that he was looked at as a complete foreigner in his own space. So how did we come to that? So those are the questions of history, I think, about the, the you know, we've talked about that here actually before. It's like the presence of our absence. That's a really important question. Uh, I guess for me, it's quite often we think about what has happened to the scattered people the past 100 years. I had a great grandmother who just passed away, uh, and that's one single person will know about her life historically. I'm 40 years old. What have I done in my life? That's history. Right? What have you done in your life? There is no books writing that. There is no talks about that woman's 100 years of living. She was born in 1913. She saw a horse and buggy, and then electric cars. <laughs> she got to the point she didn't want to leave a house at all. Okay, But right, where's that, where, are the, where are those stories? Because I think part of that will help fill the gap between arrival of Europeans, and then we're magically here today to talk to you. Mm -hmm. Where's all that information? Mm -hmm. And I think for me personally, that hyper-focus of, you know, uh, 1600 to like 1900 exactly, is just, right, it's left to interpretation, it's left to, um, you know, European understanding. You don't speak a language, you don't understand a group of people, you don't even know why they look the way they look, and we're still trying to interpret that. That's strange. Just like me coming to your house and saying, well, why do you eat peas on Wednesday instead of Tuesday with a salad fork instead of a meat fork? I don't know. <laughs> right? I don't understand those traditions and cultures. Yet we still want to regurgitate that and, and, and spill it over and write about it and, and talk about it instead of saying, what is relevant to me today as, as a human being? Well, what's relevant to me is for the past 40 years, right? I'm a big 80s kid. You know, Nintendo, Pepsi, and, you know, go-go music, and, you know, I love cars. I ride a Harley Davidson. Like, even though I'm an indigenous and native, those things are relevant to me and what my grandmother talked about then. And at that time, she was doing what everyone else's, everyone else's great-grandmother was doing, cooking in the kitchen, riding around in a 1929 Hudson. I didn't even know that existed, that, that automotive manufacturer existed. Winding up the car, she used to say that it was like a Cadillac. You know, you had a little, a little teeny thing, you put a camel in, and that was your, your lights to get down the road. <laughs> Yeah, so learning about those things in a modern world, because even though we are indigenous, we are relevant, we live like everyone else, 
even a hundred years ago. You know, and I think that would help us to reconnect as well as a human being, as a person who is just not 1600s, invisible for a long time and then here. Mm -hmm. It's like magic. So I still, I go out and I, I talk to, to, to kids in libraries in Washington, D.C. and they ask me, where's my horse? And I'm like, well, I have a ram truck outside. <laughs> you know, or I don't know. And we're talking about five-year-olds. Where are they getting this stuff from? Mm -hmm. Right? It's got to be mom and dad because school doesn't talk about it anymore. So they're still John Wayne it, even though John Wayne is, you know, whatever. Right? So there has to be a, there has to be that filter. When do we arrive? When do we show up? When do we become present in your home? No. When do we say again? Somebody no. tell me. Right, exactly, we didn't. It's just that you don't have knowledge of those things. And I think that it's, I think sometimes I give the fault to my mother, my grandmother, and my great-grandmother because they were very insular. We don't care about you, we care about us. We went to school together. When they left school, they went and hung out together. They called the ball diamond. They, they hung out the ball diamond together. They married each other. My mother and my father, fourth cousins. We don't care about you because, right, there's a tremendous amount of hate, pain, and instead of trying to change your mind, it's be gone. We just don't want to deal with you. We'll just deal with us. So a big part of that is miseducation for you. And then, you know, some people ask, well, why should we have to educate you? Why should we have to talk to you about who we were and who we are and why your last name is Proctor? Don't you marry your cousins and all that? Yeah, dude, that's how we're here. <laughs> and the empire you came from also did the same thing, maybe even closer. <laughs> okay? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that's just the reality of it. So there's a lot of, of nasty gookiness that we've had to swim through. Okay, about, yeah, I went to Gwen Park High School and I have, oh, you're, you're, you're a proctor, you're one of those people. Mm -hmm. Damn right. <laughs> and I wear it with a crown on my head because that, that gives us a, a sense of connection that no one else has in this community. And if you learn about that last name, you know that we are the first to carry it. So if you call me a proctor, you're calling me Piscataway. Period. Yeah. So, you know, there's, of course, now modern day, we have some people who are mixed, and that's okay. And they don't connect to that, that indigenous realm. And that's okay, too. Raise your hand if you know 16,000 years of your history. How about 40 years of your history? Not many people raise their hand when I say that, but when it comes to us, we gotta know everything down to the T. Mm -hmm. And if we don't, well, you're not a real Indian man. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> My grandmother, great grandmother, would talk about oneness, even though she was Catholic, talk about oneness and come home and do things in the most traditional way without even knowing it. But spent her entire life for recognition so that a group of people who don't, who still don't even know who we are, to recognize us. And what she didn't understand is that she was being who she was through just simple biology and DNA. I can go down a list of those things that she did. Okay? But I think that, that let's, let's start with the 100 years here. I can start with just 40 years and, and talk just what I call shoot the, shoot the crap because that's just my style, <laughs> okay? And just talk about stories. And that'll give you an insight that is historic, I guess if you want to say it's just not, you know, 16,000 years old, but it'll help you to understand who we are today on this panel and why we don't, like you say, look the same. Or why, you know, some of you have the last name Proctor, some of you have the last name Harley. And why are you not together? And all the other questions you have. It's just like anybody else's family. Except extra special. <laughs>
And I think the most beautiful part of that is that now it has changed and we have allowed each and every one of you to be a part of our families, to be a part of our culture, to be a part of our history. Our history is your history. It is to be the most important thing on your list to teach you, your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren about First Peoples history and get it from the people, the horse's mouth, because we're still living it today. I'm still walking that today with those same people. That's it, I'm done. Sorry, Chris. That's not talking for Um, in terms of what's important about history, I got in trouble with the Maryland Historical Society. This is a fun story. Um, so, I forget why, but something went up on, on one of their websites that was a timeline of, of Piscataway history in Maryland. And the timeline started at somewhere around 15,000 15, years ago, you know, at the end of the last ice age, when we supposedly forced to come our way down the Chesapeake Valley. <laughs> Everything melted, and you know, the big game was down here, and we were supposed to be killed all that, and you know, blah, blah, blah. 16,000 years ago, and then the next freaking dot on the timeline was in 1607. <laughs> like for 16,000 freaking years, all we did was wait for John Smith's jaundiced ass to show up. <laughs> and I'm sitting at work watching this, you know, and back then I'm not a farmer. I'm a, executive at a software company and people still call me about this and say, remember that time you were in your office and yelled, what the F? <laughs> and everybody heard you. That's how infuriating it is when you see you know, a, a span of time that's so big you don't know what it is. Like you hear people talking about the one percent economic inequality and people don't realize how far a billion is from a million because <laughs> yeah. they just seem like such big numbers. But it's a big number. <laughs> It's a big number with a lot of history and a lot of context. And it just gets erased. And it starts at our Holocaust. Can you imagine trying to, you know, being someone who isn't Jewish, only wanting to talk about the Holocaust with Jewish people? You know, we, that's an important part of our history. It's a crucial, extremely important part of our history, especially our modern people in terms of who we've become. But it's not all there is. And when you talk about that flash of time, you know, in the in the 17th century, where you know our lives fundamentally changed forever, and you compare that against the full size and scope of our history in this place, it barely registers when you look at the size of the numbers. So it's you know there, there were so many developments that that got us to where we were. You know, how did we become this complex society where we had these these rivalries with tribes up north, with the Massawamites, with some of the Six Nations, what, what became the Six Nations people. Why did we come together sometimes and split apart? You know, why were there these cultural and social and political upheavals going on within the society, irrespective of when Europeans showed up? It never gets talked about, ever. It's always about John Smith. It's always about the Ark of the Dove. It's always about that guy across the river. Burns Villages. <laughs> when Sakata Fort was found, which is you know, the holy grail of archaeology in Maryland and for a lot of Native people as well, I sat in the room where they presented you know, some of the tribal leaders with what they found. And I sat there through gritted teeth hearing stories about George Watson's grandfather and how there were intersectionalities with you know, how this brings together everything from Bacon's Rebellion to Washington to the Native story. And it takes everything you have not to scream at the top of your lungs. Intersectionality buries Indians every time. Because we always become subsumed into how did America become America? And it gets back to that thing where, from our perspective, y'all are still here. When are you leaving? And I don't mean that about the individual in this room, of course. You know, my wife is the whitest woman in America. I don't want her to go <laughs> but, <clears throat> but that perspective is just something that never, ever gets addressed or acknowledged, even from people who mean well. Um, you know, to, say, to say the least, uh, you know, there's people out there who don't want that story told. They want it to be about them. They want it, it you know, a bad thing happened to the Indians, but we're all okay now. And in a lot of ways we are, and in a lot of ways we're not. 
And without that honesty, history can't really serve us in solving problems that we, that we have to deal with today, whether it's personal problems, whether it's environmental problems, political problems, those solutions lie in acknowledging the full scope of that history. So, you know, there's no individual thing that I would point to as being, you know, what's, what's the most important thing that you know, pops up, you know, like the whack-a-mole that says, hey, let's, let's talk about that. There's, there's any number of events. You know, how did corn get all the way up here from South America? They didn't FedEx it. We didn't have Amazon. <coughs> there were trade routes. People communicated. We were not these isolated, insular tribes. A lot of people don't understand that when a lot of us, you know, not only Piscataways, but other people, when we were finally encountered by Europeans, disease got to us first, sometimes literally decimating us, 9% of population loss. And as tragic and amazing as if you, if you look at that, you know, from maybe a military standpoint, for example, it's amazing how hard a time white people had beating us on the battlefield, given that we were literally at 10% strength in a lot of these cases. What kind of society produces people willing to fight that hard and that effectively for the places they live in to not be dispossessed and killed? That history needs to be talked about. I'd like to ask, uh, how much time before we open it to the audience? Whenever you're ready. Um, okay, I have one more question and then we'll open it to the audience. Um, and that question is, um, listening to what you all, all had to say, Crystal, uh, it sounded to me, and maybe I, I don't know if I heard this right, but I think I heard you saying, I'm tired of having to represent every day. And, uh, you know, and that, and that I will know all these answers. And, and Chris, you know, the story, um, that uh, the story that's told is just whacked, you know, that there's a, uh, and it's completely European, even when it does include Indians, it's completely European. And Gavi, I was really moved by your comment uh, about your father being a foreigner in his own land. I mean, that really uh, just is, is really says a lot in just a few words. Um, and I wanted to ask about civil rights, but I also want to move to the uh, to the um, audience. So I think my last question, just for the panel before we open it up, is hearing this and much of what we haven't talked about in the 40 years outside of this 20 minutes, um, what would you like to see happen here on this landscape? I know that's a broad question, but it's one of our questions. <laughs> so it's, it's like if you were, you know, if you were in charge, what would you like to see? I guess, I guess I'll go first this time. <laughs> forcing it off on me. <laughs> oh, if I were in charge. Um, so, I kind of articulated this, this idea of the National Food Forest as a place that, that blended indigenous land management ethics with modern technology and with modern reality. Um, the idea of how do you create a space that can produce food, that can produce fuel, produce fiber, recreation, a place to live, you know, a, a place to be spiritual, to be a human being, all in the same place, without having to zone it and segregate it and, you know, just put all these artificial walls up um, inside of it. That was the driving goal behind, you know, behind the National Food Forest idea. That's what I would like to see done with it. Um, you know, if, if it were me and, you know, I got Paul hopped up on speed and you know he and I were just like here, just like uh, he and him and Joe and all the other people who do agriculture around here, we'd be setting fire to some of the woods and we'd be replanting indigenous and uh, you know indigenous plants and indigenous trees. We would make this place look like the Edenic landscape that was found by people like John Smith. You would not see choked woods. Things would be on fire all the time. Because that's just what we did. Um, and that's how we built forests, that's how we built topsoil, that's how we made this into a place where you didn't have to have a job. You know, life for Native people, pre-contact, you know, after contact, when we were still living with quote unquote traditional lifestyles, it wasn't easy. But, damn if I can't imagine we weren't happier. Um, you know, nothing worth doing is ever easy, but managing that landscape and having that be your life 
And when I talk about the soil being literally composed of the blood and bones of the people that came before you and put you on this planet, for you to spend your life taking care of that, where that's your job, there's no better thing anyone could ever do with their life. I don't care what they say. I challenge anybody any day of the week. If I could, that's what I'd do. Um, the issue you have is that <clears throat> Native people didn't do homesteading. Like, you know, I'm a farmer, and so people see that I'm a, you know, quote unquote, permaculture farmer. They always want to talk about their homestead and their one acre, their two acres, their privately owned three acres, four acres, five acres, and, and try to tie that into indigenous ethics. And I try to tell them that the idea of private land ownership is stupid as hell when you really think about it. I mean, if, if you imagine everybody in here got shipwrecked on an island that's maybe a thousand acres, the idea that anybody in here, that land that now has to sustain all of us, that somebody would cordon off a piece of it and say, this is mine and screw you, you'd get together and kill that guy because this land has to support all of us. You have private property, you have your hut, you have your lodge, you have your bow, you have your kids, you have your clothes, you have the stuff that you need, but the land is everybody's. And the desert island, you know, the island concept, that, that expands out to everybody. You know, this earth is a closed system. We are on an island. We are alone. And we're not going anywhere. So, it, you know, as, as much as I'd like to turn this place into what was, there's a reality outside of here that it doesn't work in little bits. It, it's a zoo exhibit if we do that. Which is why, you know, the, the food force has this concept of not only being an island unto itself, but evangelizing that concept to other people. That's why I don't farm on my own land. It's why I farm Stratford Hall. It's why I'm after James Madison's Montpelier. One day I'm going to be after Mount Vernon. I want it all. <laughs> because eventually it has to be, it has to be everything. It can't just be the zoo exhibit where we, you know, look at it and say, man isn't that perfect while the climate heats up to you know, five degrees Celsius and we're all done. Um, so that's what I'd like to see. Give me that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm a. I could talk a long time, but I think that without disrespecting you, that is an empire question because leadership was never given to one person. And for me, my life at this very moment is trying to dig that colonization and empire aspect out of my system with a spoon, literally, okay? Um, and I guess my only answer could be is the power we give it back to the people. That's all I can say. I want to live there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, there's, it's, it's an interesting question to think about what, what would you do if you won, if you got what you wanted, um, or not just what we want, but this idea of decolonization, there's another side to that too that I like to think about that's called indigenize. And indigenize, it's an approach and it's a way of being. It may be, um, maybe it's coming from peoples who still carry those philosophies, but it's an approach to be part of the land. I was listening to, um, so my, my clock radio goes off <laughs> early in the morning, and a couple of weeks ago, I heard, um, it was a physicist talking about, about place, and it was so indigenous. It was so intensely indigenous where she said, when you, look out at the universe, you are part of the universe looking at itself. And coming from that really esoteric part to this, um, what you're thinking about for Chris and Crystal, it's, it's looking at how do we restore and regenerate. And we're in a place that, you know, I've, I've traveled, I've been traveling, I've traveled a lot um, in the Native world, and especially in the past two years. And one of the most intense places I went to, most beautiful places among so many, was at Hopi. Um, Hopi where they're still living on the mesas and the elder men 
Uh, because so many people are not able to do the traditional farming anymore because of the, you know, the economy is hard. It's hard work. They come down off those mesas and they they farm their, their land and it's all run through what we call clans, which are extended families. All of that being intact and it's it's mostly a much older generation that's still practicing that. And I think that we're in a place here where we are really all, we are all together, right? It's, it's, you can't really separate us, we're intermarried, our children, our mothers, our aunts, our uncles, the people that we're, we're around, people that, we're, that are living on this land, whether it's um, the past 400 years or maybe um, there's newcomers. To me, um, I see relatives coming up for Central America and I look at the place, I, I look at their faces and they're the faces of our ancestors and I'm so happy to have them here. I wish we could welcome them and bring them back because they are the people that invented corn. So thinking about this, this landscape and what can happen, we're not in a situation like New Mexico or Arizona where they're able still, you know, the, any of you who've been out there, you know, like you can just like drive <laughs> and drive and drive. And I'm like, where is the gas station? <laughs> and, um, you know, me being up on, and up on cliffs and in canoes and all this stuff, like, uh, you know, <laughs> with, with elder women and in their spaces and seeing that. But, but our, our consideration is it's distinctive because nobody's going anywhere and we don't want you to um, and so or I don't and so I think that when we're looking at a, a place like this it's not just you know a, a place under glass or a little you know like a zoo exhibit how could we do that and I think that we do have these, this possibility uh, something that our family has dedicated intergenerationally to is in the continual and dynamic practice of spiritual tradition. And it's been difficult to have full access onto a sacred site. Uh, it's, it's, it, was a, it, was, it was a source of extreme conflict for decades. <clears throat> And I really have to credit Akukik for being the first ones to reach across. Wilton called me in 2007 and said, I think we, we should talk. And I know that was also coming from, uh, from Jim and from Jean and from other people. And at first I, I couldn't believe that you called me. <laughs> you know, it was to call and talk say, you know, we need, we need to, we need to really come together and shift this and change it. So it's 2007, you know, it's not that long ago. You know, if you think about like 1607, 2007, it's like 400 years, it's like, that's a long time. <laughs> um, and starting to think about that and looking at it in program, but again, that this is, this is living earth. This is living part of our lives, not just separated. And in addition to uh, that complete vision that, that you're bringing forward, Chris, I think that you know our peoples, we don't separate, traditionally, we don't separate spirit from economy, from government, from all of those things. I mean, we have to in, in some ways now, right? But I would love to see um, a possibility of keeping this space open and breathing for an ongoing culture and spiritual practice without having to, I'm just going to be really blunt, um, without having to apply for a permit, which we have to apply for every single ceremony that we have had over the past 50 years. We have to apply four times a year for a permit to come down into the burial grounds. I'm just being very real. Um, it's exhausting. And having to see about whether or not it's, um, we have somebody who is nice, you know, 
um, either in the organizations or among the neighbors or within the park service. You, know, you can have somebody nice and they're interested and they're supportive, but then, you know, National Capital Parks East isn't always like everybody's pinnacle of somebody's career, you know, so they move on. And uh, just recently, you know, people got locked in, locked out. Luckily, we have, um, we have, you know, we have good relationships now. I'm so happy about that. Happy being a, and it's not like such a simple word, but really, it's, it, it was a lot of work. So, within this park, with, you know, park, within this landscape, even if it is just one area and then seeing about you know how it can grow and breathe and be because you can't just have an isolated space but this is a significant amount of space um, and it does not infringe upon anybody else's way of being I think that Native peoples and our cultures as source cultures and especially with the state of the world as it is, these are actually very dangerous times. I'm just putting that on the table, you all know it. The water is rising, fires are burning, the levels of violence are rising. Um, people are, it, it's, it's hard. And so when we have these um, possibilities of places that are protected, um, that when we look at the solutions and they do look more and more indigenous, you know, they're coming, you know, it's, it's almost like when they, they find that um, the way of interplanting or, or you know, science, scientists are finding out, wow, that's this great, you know, system of companion planting, you know, it's like, that's great. And, and then you go back and it's, it's really an indigenous Thing. I mean, even to the point of, of, you know, hard physical sciences where we look at, you know, string theories and ideas about dark matter and all of those, those pieces. And I'm talking about this without knowing hardly anything about science, but it just sounds really cool. <laughs> and, um, and listening to, because it resonates, it resonates. So in the sense of, of what at least um, could be of this place to expand it is looking at it as living space and the support of the daily ongoing practice of culture um, and to be supported in doing that uh, in a way that is relational instead of regulated. So that's what I would, I would like to put out there in addition to what my relatives are saying. Uh, thank you. I think we'll go ahead and open it to the um, audience. Um, are the, uh, does anybody have a question? I want to make sure we don't lose sight of the uh, cards. Oh, I can say it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Please do. All right. So all three of you have talked about how the Skyway people can re or have reciprocated and continue to reciprocate to one another and to the earth. Um, all the things that we want to feel and. I don't really know how to articulate this any better right now, so forgive me. But what are the ways in which people who live here today, who are occupying um, our ancestral homelands, what are the ways in which they can reciprocate not only to us, but to the land that they live on? Repeat question. I think, go ahead. Oh, no. <laughs> I think what you said was, how can the people that are here today, what, can, how can they reciprocate? Yeah, or the society today. I feel, like, I feel like we're not having enough conversation about how to move forward. We're just about, we're like, someone has already mentioned that we're talking about the Skyway people in the past, but like we're still sitting right in the room with you. Like, what are the ways that, like, we need to move forward? It's not only just rec because recognition is not enough, acknowledgement is not enough, but can each and every single person in this room, but in society in general, do to honor us and women, basically. Well, that's a great question. And I know, I just wanted to start our young relative, Valerie Marie Proctor, who is on a great forefront of, uh, among, among you, Bonnie, I see in the room, there's others 
that are here um, looking at some things that are specifically happening and you know, looking at the Nanjimoy Forest, for example. We want to talk about that as well since we're having a conversation. Um, looking at the Potomac Pipeline, um, that impacts every single one of us and beyond. So would you like to talk more about that, the Nanjimoy Forest issue? Uh, sure. Um, just real quick. Um, you know, I'm there's a privately owned property down in Pisgah, um, 240, actually around 300 acres now of it will be deforested for Georgetown University to put in a solar installation to power their university. Um, and we have been trying to oppose the uh, project and um, I'm losing my train of thought right now. Uh, May 3rd, uh, May 13th, excuse me, May 13th in, um, <clears throat> in La Plata, there's going to be a, a second um, Maryland in Department of Environment hearing. And uh, this uh, clear cut would uh, actually turn what was a, a, a top value forest dedicated as an um, important bird area by Audubon and by DNR as a, 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 the high, a highest quality forest. It's part of the largest forest remaining in Southern Maryland. And it would be uh, clear cut in order for, for, for Georgetown University to meet their sustainability goals, which really tightens the screws on just how terrible it is, because um, they're not looking at the full picture, obviously. So on May, thir May 13th, in La Plata, there's going to be the second MBE hearing, first hearing, so many people signed up to speak that didn't get to be called at the first hearing. So the second hearing, the continuation of the hearing, and we need people to come out. It's it's not only this forest, but it's in, in the face of climate change, we want to change the direction. We have to change the direction. And we need to protect solar from bad actors that are trying to put solar in inappropriate places. So it's this forest in Nanjimoy, the largest one remaining in Southern Maryland, is a, is a pivot point for our awareness of how we have to do these things right. We cannot afford to make the, the, the mistakes that we have made for so long. So uh, we have more information about the, this hearing and the importance of being involved. And I think there's going to be a demonstration at Georgetown also. So uh, we hope everybody here can get a little bit involved. It's extremely important. Um, Ms. Ms. Rocker, did you want to add anything to that? Good. And thank you, Valerie, for all the work you've done on this. Um, I'd like to suggest that one way, I'm speaking as the chair of Abby Keegan, as a community member, to offer of being, um, living in a reciprocal way and honoring people in the land is for us to make sure that we have vital networks, and thank you Bonnie for that information, that we have vital connections that we can communicate swiftly, effectively, and listen, and be organized in a way that we can take swift action, and hopefully so that we can be out in front and we can affect how counties and states have policies <coughs> so that we can be out in front and affect how decisions are made for permitting and things like this, and be able to suggest places that are prime affect where people select to do uh, solar energy, and that we are we are better connected and make sure that we're we're able to take these steps that would honor people and land. Just one thought about how that. Do any of our panelists have a question? Yeah, um, so I want to address um, what you said directly. Um, I'm going to be honest, that's the first time I've gotten that question from a fellow person of color. Usually, 
it's white people asking that question, and it's almost like an attack. It's like, you made all these complaints, so what, what, what can I do? Um, and I'm not saying you're saying it that way, but it's, it's interesting to, you know, to, have, to have people of color also ask that question. You know, if, if we're here and we're asking these questions then, and we're bringing up these points, then what can you do? Um, because culturally, we're, we're an action-oriented people. We're, a, we're positive people and not a negative people. And what I mean by positive is a presence of action rather than an absence of action. Um, when people have asked me that in the past, what can I do, usually the first thing I ask them is, what you got? <laughs> when the CEO and Kat Imhoff at Montpelier called me and said, hey, I've seen all the things you've written about, you know, indigenous farming, black farming, and, you know, what can I do? And the first thing I said to him was, was, I want to be able to farm all your land, all of it. You know, it's like, it's, it's the thing from, from uh, what is it, Mad Men, where, what was the thinking, Connie Hilton, so the owner of Hilton Hotels, and he goes to Don Draper, and he says, next time somebody like me, in a position like me, asks you a question, what do you want? Aim big. So, <laughs> I did. But not everybody is in a position to be able to offer me, you know, 2,500 acres to be able to farm when I want, when I'm able to, you know, get enough Native and uh, Indigenous people and Black people and, and Latinx people to come in and, and take care of that place the way it needs to be taken care of. Um, so that's when you get into, you know, what I call, you know, Coralism, the corollary to activism, which I think is pessimism. Sometimes you just have to listen to things you've never heard before. Because you know, I, I hope that a lot of the people here have heard things, especially the white people here, have heard things that are new and have maybe blown your hair back a little bit. But sometimes there isn't something to do right now. Sometimes you just have to listen and internalize what you've heard and wait for an opportunity to arise to apply it. Because it's dangerous to think that you know you listen to what uh, Dr. Tyak and Chris and I are saying with you today, and that there's a letter you can write, or an email you can send, or somebody's back to pat, or something you can do, and then it gives you the impression that I did my part, I'm done. Um, so that's that's always a dangerous rabbit hole to go down. Um, so for the average person who you know doesn't have stuff to give, and it doesn't have you know, lots of leverage with you know, institutions or people that can make a huge difference. A lot of it's just listen, internalize, and wait. And just be that seed that's waiting for the right temperature and the right amount of moisture to sprout and do what you're supposed to do. Whether it's somebody making an asinine comment that otherwise would go unchallenged in your presence as a white person, because you know, being married to a white family, I've seen the conversations that y'all have among yourselves. And sometimes <laughs> it's pretty messed up. And you know, I just think, you know, if I'm not in this room and I'm not there to challenge what's being said, then somebody else needs to be. So the best thing you can do, you know, the average person is be a mold. You know, hear what I say, and then the next time that somebody, you know, asks some question like, you know, does this Indian live in a real house, or you know, has some asinine thing to say about Native history, or talks about Native people being gone, challenge them. One word can change so much because the next, you, know, you tell that person that, they're not going to forget. Because white people are not used to being challenged by other white people on matters of race. Ever. It almost never happens. Especially not in private. Um, so that's, that's what I'd recommend. Other questions? I guess we didn't get any index <coughs> cards. You can have Thank you. Any questions? Um, but I wrote it on a card, but I'm going to share it all <laughs> um, I had the great pleasure of attending my daughter's uh, university commencement ceremony in Brisbane, Australia. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm sorry I missed it here, I won't have it, but in Australia, for major events, whether it's a commencement or governmental events, uh, they have a welcome to country acknowledgement. Uh, it doesn't, it's not scripted, but it basically the, the elements is it acknowledges the local indigenous people, Pays respect to the traditional custodians of the land, uh, where they happen to be meeting that day. And then on behalf of those people, on behalf of the Piscataway people, uh, we welcome you all to the start of this meeting. And I'm wondering, should we start doing that more in the United States? I've seen it in some meetings. I don't see it here at Akiki Foundation Functions all that often when it's just, you know, Akiki Foundation Functions. But is that something that would help remind people that you're standing on uh, 16,000 years or uh, 
maybe deeper in other locations uh, of that land and the people who nurtured the land and got us to where we all are, all are uh, today. Um, yes, <laughs> and from my perspective, and I think that, you know, two, about two years ago, uh, there was an extraordinary group of voyagers who came here, um, right to Akuki, a group of uh, Native Hawaiians on the Hokalea voyaging canoe. And they had made, they were going on a worldwide journey on this vessel. And it was a way of them restoring their just really brilliant, I mean, talk about brilliant um, non-instrument navigation around the world. And they had been doing this for quite a long time, but this is the first time they had come up worldwide and they made a point of asking permission to land and, and honoring the people all along the way. And I remember on that day, which was, it was one of the most powerful things that I had experienced. Thinking, what if all of you on the Hokalea had been the ones who came here 400 years ago? Because the last people who came ashore um, it was it was a long time ago, right? And it was a completely different set of relationships. So it's definitely a tradition that that many of our people have done here in North America, and it's become much more of a, a practice of what I've I've also seen that in Australia and the, the Pacific <coughs> people, and just taking on here land acknowledgement. So there's um, there's an increasing amount. It used to be, I think, more where Native people would ask that. You know, we, we engage in that protocol with each other. When, when I go somewhere, I'm sure when you guys go somewhere, you acknowledge and thank the, the host, maybe bring them, you know, a gift, and, you know, engage in that way. Um, and now it's becoming more widespread of the process of land acknowledgement. Um, I think probably all of us have, have engaged in that in some way or done them, and it's it's starting to increase. Um, what's been really interesting to me is that it's a it's a beautiful practice, and now I'm starting to think about the practicality because there's not always all that many of us, and we live in a large metropolitan area. <laughs> so, kind of thinking about okay, so how do you you know how are we going to engage in this very good practice and way of being with each other if we can't always be, you know, we can't always be there. You know, can't be at, at every meeting. It's it's a great problem to have, I'll just say that. And I appreciate that that being brought up. It's happened in the past several years where I've seen it picking up speed in the area and I think it also shows the results of a lot of work that we've all done to come to another level of respect. So, I was going to say, just as a quick follow up, it wasn't an indigenous person who mm -hmm. made the remarks, it was whoever was the mm -hmm. speaker for that day. That's great. Uh, that, and I don't know, as, uh, would it create issues for someone like me to say, on behalf of you know, the Piscataway people, the people who were, who were the first to this land, I, I welcome to the start of this meeting. I think that you may not be able to say on behalf of, right. but what what I would see, and I would certainly invite other comments on this, would be if you acknowledged and thanked um, the Piscataway people and ancestors uh, that were here on this landscape, and then not just doing the words, but to again thinking about um, how to engage in a relationship, because that's really important. And so if there's some way to, um, to you know, there's the words, but it's also the action, that's what we're talking about, reciprocity, actually, right? Which is the theme of today. So it's, it's that, it's the relationship um, that's built. Yeah, and speak, I mean, I kind of want to jump on that a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, it's probably my father's fault, but I am extremely wary of 
anything that smells like virtue signaling. Um, smells like what? Virtue signaling. Um, saying the right thing, but not necessarily doing the right thing. <laughs> um, my cousin, um, my cousin Tess, asked for permission to wear um, eagle feathers that she'd been gifted um, or immortal when she graduated. She passed. Um, you know, me and all my male privilege and being six feet tall, I just wore mine. And if anybody had anything to say about it, <laughs> I hope they had insurance. Um, <laughs> but you know, the idea that, and this was in the University System of America, you know, she went and asked for permission to wear her, her eagle feathers on the waterboard, and they said no. Um, so it would, it would really stick in my craw if that was, you know, you're talking about actions versus words, if, if that was the action, but then these same people are maybe giving some kind of you were here first, let's acknowledge who you are kind of thing. Like that actually makes me more angry. I'd rather them just tell me to go to hell so I can know who my friends are. Um, so it's, uh, I don't, I don't want to make it sound like I'm jumping on anything. It's, it's this idea um, that we can do these acknowledgements. They're easy. Um, they're almost too easy. They're important. We want to be acknowledged because we've been ignored for so long. Um, but at the same time, we don't want that to be something that gets done instead of real action. You know, letting us have access to places, letting us be able to go and honor our grandfathers without having to apply for permits four times a year and pay for them. To go on our own land where our own people are buried. Land that's made out of our grandmothers. We have to pay to access. It's bullshit. And we have to acknowledge that and I think we have to do that and make those concrete actions before we do things like, you know, kind of the more, I don't want to call it ceremonial, but kind of the more superficial things. You know, and it's, again, I hate to call it superficial because it does matter. That acknowledgement does matter. But that acknowledgement can be used as a weapon, and it has been used as a weapon. To, you know, say that we've done our part and we're not going to do any more. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think that kind of thing is, you've got to be careful about how deep your relationship is with someone before you start, uh, for lack of a better term, blowing sunshine up their asses. Um, because it, sometimes it doesn't feel so good when the rest of the relationship is effectively toxic and sometimes abusive. And I think that's all. I have a question from the crowd, a good old time. Um, and this uh, uh, individual asked if you all would address native perspectives on climate change. Mm. <laughs> I think everyone has questions. Chris, yeah. Chris, yeah. Chris, yeah. Chris, Chris wanted to go fry some bread. Yes. I <laughs> <laughs> like open the door and like, hey. Um, climate change. I think when you talk about all of the all of the things that indigenous people have been saying for hundreds of years about what happens when things are out of balance and it was just seen maybe as, well, that's, that's just happening in, in these remote places or it's just happening with a, a certain group of people um, or that could never happen to me. It's happening to all of us and that is an incredible eye-opener that it's not a remote situation anymore. And the reality is, is that indigenous peoples, peoples of color in particular, people in the global south, are all impacted by climate change and have been on the forefront of that. You know, it's a frontline situation. Uh, the factors coming from it uh, the mining of, of coal and things that are supposed to be in the earth. Uh, sometimes they're characterized, uh, when you talk about Navajo areas, it's, it's the liver of Mother Earth, where if you dig into that, that you're going to unleash a, an underworld monster. Well, that is exactly true. It's not a story. It's reality. So Native peoples have been on the forefront of the climate change 
moment or what led up to it from the very beginning, uh, from the very beginning of colonization to the present. Um, my I've been really excited. My daughter, was gonna, you know, just for like this new generation, I've seen it's been young indigenous people, um, particularly young women, you know, I mean, mine is 17, I guess she's a woman, she's still my baby, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she's not here to look at me like, <laughs> um, but they, they have been organizing and working across the hemisphere, actually, coming together on climate issues. The people that we're seeing displaced um, in Guatemala and other places, indigenous people, it's climate related. A lot of it, you know. So it's um, it's something that's been a, a forefront issue because it's a forefront experience for Native communities um, across all of it. Here in the Chesapeake, again, we're seeing impacts right away. You know, we've been seeing them. Uh, maybe you haven't, you know, people that are on land, I know for you, you're probably seeing it much more. So it's, it's not a theoretical idea anymore. But it's Native people who are, um, they're dying first and absorbing that first and our ecosystems and the people who live within those ecosystems. And now it's, you know, it's coming for everyone. Um. I said earlier that today we have a fundamentally extractive relationship with the land and with the earth. And what we've done is we've, we've recognized how much the land and the earth has to give and we've taken as much as we can. And we've put a cushion between ourselves and that land. That cushion can be called any number of things. It can be called the economy. It could be called modern culture jobs, politics, people's dreams and aspirations of, you know, whatever jobs they want, being CEOs, being college professors, being, you know, being all these things that distance themselves from what fundamentally sustains us. And we've done it long enough where we think that's going to save us. Um, we've lost sight of the fact that no matter how high we get, no matter how much stuff we have, no matter how comfortable we are, because we're lucky enough to live in a first world what for now is a democracy. Um, we think that you know, this is, climate change is a thing that's happening to somebody else. And fundamentally, the way we behave, the way we vote, the way we consume, our actions say that we're okay with it. Um, that, that's all, that's me included. Um, nobody's innocent in this. Um, our culture is created just a fundamentally poisoned relationship with the land, and I've never seen it more starkly than when I went from being not a farmer to becoming a farmer. Um, it's it's one thing when you've you know, you've grown up on a farm, you've got multi, you know, many generations of people who've been on the land, and it's just what you've been in. But I'm in a unique situation where I can see it in relief, um, and just the sheer degree of of how little people understand that they depend on landscapes, um, how much they depend on topsoil to be able to filter water, how much they depend on air being a certain temperature and humidity, how much of a difference it makes if wheat or corn sprouts 10 days too early or too late. <coughs> if, it, you know, if you get three inches of rain in a day, your average person sitting in the office is, oh, the commute's gonna suck. You got a farmer out there somewhere going, holy shit, how am I gonna feed everybody? because you've got a wheat crop standing in water, it's going to rot. Um, and, you know, people have to eat that. And for now, you know, we've got the idea that, you know, if this guy in Nebraska, if his crop fails and somebody else in Kentucky or in China or Brazil or whatever, somebody's going to make up the shortfall, but as the climate changes enough, there isn't going to be a buck to pass. You know, eventually we're screwed. And I don't know who said it, but basically society is three missed meals away from chaos. And we're getting closer and closer to that kind of thing being, being reality. When we see, you know, as a farmer, you know, it's raining longer and harder 
When it's dry, it stays dry for so long. When you just see, like, you know, when you see the capitalization, the, the influence of capitalism, which can be a good thing when regulated properly, but can be a bad thing when just left to run wild like a pig with no fences. You see seed stocks just becoming narrower and narrower. There's a genetic bottleneck going on in seeds that nobody knows about. And people don't understand that it's, you know, we're one or two pathogens away from having entire global crop, global crops wiped out. It can happen. It's happened in the past. And today, we're just so far removed from the land that we don't, we don't understand how, how vulnerable we are. Um, and so, you know, I would, I would hope that the indigenous outlook on the land is that, you know, as far away as we may get, we never forget what's important. Even if we don't know how to grow plants, even if we don't know how to grow crops or grow animals or draw a living from, from that land, there's a certain respect that's there that doesn't exist in, other, in the broader society. And for, for a lot of people outside of indigenous circles, land is a thing that you accumulate. It's a thing that you own. It's a thing that you draw boundaries around. It's a thing that you kick other people off because this is mine. It's not a cooperative mindset that's going to be necessary to deal with things like climate change, which threaten everybody, fundamentally. Um, yeah, I'll stop there because, God, I could just go on forever about the native alpha you know, Climate change, I almost hate the term because it sounds like climate change is a thing that's happening by itself. You know, it's, the planet is dying and we're holding the knife. It's, it's, you know, the climate is part of it, but that's a small part. You know there's a lot of consideration to renaming the, or creating a new geological epoch. That's the Anthropocene. Anthropocene. It uh, involves with uh, human, the human involvement. We have time for one more question. Um, yes, Chris, could you share some words to explain permaculture? Because I've read definitions. But... Uh, Permaculture is, you ask 40 people what permaculture is, you're going to get 40 different answers. Um, for me, permaculture is woodland indigenous agriculture. And it's, it's an agriculture that isn't agriculture. Permaculture is it's a way of living. It's a way where you have mutually reinforcing systems um, that produce food, that produce fuel, that produce fire, that produce a living for people, that produce happiness, that produce places to be spiritual and engage with the land and the people. It's, it's a way of life. That's, that's difficult to explain. Um, if you ask anybody else what permaculture is, most of them will tell you it's fully self-sustaining agriculture, um, which is a term that I have problems with because on Earth there are no closed systems. There's no such thing. Um, you are going to be influenced by something outside of your little piece of heaven, whether you like it or not. Um, <clears throat> but if you ask, you know, like the common definition of permaculture, it, it's the idea that everything feeds itself. You have, you, know, you have no inputs coming in from outside. There's no waste. Um, and you produce, you produce food in a space where you can do everything else. It's kind of like homesteading on steroids, where there's no waste and everything's incredibly efficient and you know, done in tune with nature. Um, the other term I put around that would be farming with nature instead of on top of it. Um, when you have, you know, you've got oak heath forest, you know, mostly in this kind of area. Instead of cutting that down to make grain fields to feed cattle on the far side of the world, you grow what wants to grow inside an oak forest so that you don't cut down those trees, you don't release that carbon, you don't disturb that soil, you don't destroy those insect habitats. You massage the landscape. You know, you might apply fire, you might apply fig, not pigs and goats, but you don't fundamentally transform the character of an ecology because there's thousands of years of evolution that says, this is what should be here. Why work against yourself? Um, that's three definitions for you. I like your broader definition. All right, I think that we're probably getting out of here. Thank you very much. We appreciate your participation and everyone's feedback. This has been a wonderful discussion. We are going to have a brief reception catered by Copper Kitchen. Thank you, Chris and Amanda. And everyone is welcome to grab a plate and join us back in this room for a public scoping session that Rob will explain. Rob, will you please give us a brief explanation of this afternoon's events? Good afternoon.
So essentially, part of the conversation that we're having today and earlier, and we will get continue next week, is part of a larger interpretive planning process. And what we're looking for is direct input from different community members and stakeholders to find the best way to allow personal meaning connections between the visitors on the site itself. So the hope is, as you see, to have meaningful discussions and dialogues about what Akaki could do. Now, the idea behind this is that we're hoping for people to be as open and honest and vulnerable as possible. These conversations, as you see, are brought to very sensitive issues, and we want this to be a safe space for people to feel welcome to talk about what they really are thinking and feel would be best suited for the group going forward. So the idea behind this is allowing people to have a meaningful discussion about the visitor experience, <coughs> identifying the stories which are most significant, talking a little bit about interpretive methodologies. Now we know this is just a very small group of people who are here representing much larger communities. So the hope is that you're able to spread the word about what we're undertaking here and invite other people to come to the session next week. But in addition to that, provide different ways of input. So we have, for those of you that can't stay with us this afternoon or who would like to take this back to other people, a sheet that they can fill out. That will be the synthesis for our conversation after the reception. And also we'll be putting information online for people who aren't able to participate directly in the workshops themselves. So the idea behind this, again, is just gathering as much input and feedback from people as possible about what you would like to see taking place, what stories you think are the most important, and in addition to that, how we can best serve the public. Does that make sense? So I hope many of you can stay after the reception. If you can't, please be sure to fill out one of these yellow sheets. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rob. We look forward to continuing this discussion after a small reception. I'd like to take, take this time again to thank my fellow Akakeek staff members for all of their help and support preparing for today's workshop. Special thank you to Mary Alice, Casey, and Daniel for setting up the education building today. Please join us for a reception in the foyer and at 4 p.m. Those who would like to continue this discussion are welcome to join us again for the public scoping. Thank you.